Thank you, Angela, and greetings, everyone. Uh, I'm Lori Ambrose and President, CEO of GoTo Foundation for Lung Cancer, and so pleased to again welcome all of you to what is our third webinar in our rapid response series. It's for our frontline care providers with today's programming focused on tools and strategies, resuming lung cancer screening amid COVID-19. And I apologize for my lost voice. I think the many Zoom uh, calls and conference calls have finally caught up with me over these many months. So the good news is that it will shorten my opening remarks. Today's discussion is intended to provide real-time information on how to restore engagement with and confidence among our screening population. We'll also discuss strategies to reprioritize lung cancer screening as a vital and essential preventive service within your health system. And finally, we'll introduce and explore American College of Radiology's newly released Return to Screening Toolkit, learning how this key resource came to be and how we can put it to good use. So joining us today to share their knowledge and experiences are Dr. Bill Mayfield, Chief Surgical Officer and Director of Lung Cancer Screenings Program at Wellstar Health Systems. Along with Bill, as you can see on the screen, I won't go into their extensive details, is Dr. Debbie Dyer, Chair of the Department of Radiology and Director of Lung Cancer Screening Program at National Jewish Health. Also joining us is Dr. Eric Hart, Associate Professor of Radiology at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine, and finally, Ashley LeBlanc, our Nursing Director at Mercy Medical Center, Trinity Health of New England. So before turning this over to Bill to kick this off, I also want to share that the program will be recorded. And as in our previous webinars, Anita McLaughlin and Angela Criswell will navigate questions that we will take up at the end of these presentations. So Bill, I turn it over to you to go to it. Thank you all. And you're on mute, Bill. I know, thank you there very you. much. That's right, okay. very kind. Let me see if I can share my screen with everybody here. I see your pretty face. Oh. And do you have my screen? All right, good. So we're gonna talk about uh, lung cancer screening in, I call it in the COVID era. Um, so there, there would be several, oh, first I have no disclosures that affect uh, any of the content of this uh, talk. So the guiding principles around uh, screening in the post COVID era for us are number one, I wanna keep patients safe, uh, keep uh, staff safe. We separate outpatient from inpatient flow. So we've made that a big point, whether it's outpatient surgery, outpatient procedures, from the inpatient uh, setting where we tend to have more uh, COVID concentration uh, or whether it's just outpatient services like this. But we're making a conscious effort in all of our services to separate outpatient from inpatient flows. And then the realization that, you know, we can do two things at once. We have our protocols, we can treat COVID patients and we can continue uh, with our daily business. So that's our guiding principles. There are some undeniable consequences of shutting uh, uh, screening, lung screening down for three months. And uh, this came, was originally published uh, by Cleveland Clinic earlier this year, it showed up in PLOS One. Uh, but uh, this, these, this is a graph of stage one lung cancer, which shows uh, a 14% re reduction in survival if you uh, delay time to initiate treatment by six weeks. Now, that is an incredible statistic to bring up when uh, we just shut down screening for three months. So for this reason alone, um, we are uh, full bore on screening. So what we've done is we've tried to uh, protect patients as much as possible. So we're, we're doing what we call no touch registration. So we reach out to our screening subjects who call us or who are ready for a repeat screen or people call into us. We're actually adding about 80 new uh, subjects per month. 
And we can register these uh, subjects by phone uh, or by computer. And uh, we use uh, MyChart, we're on Epic. Uh, Medicare now allows uh, telehealth shared decision-making. So our primary care physicians do most of our shared decision-making, but uh, if not, we have uh, nurse practitioners who will do that. Uh, and that can be done by telehealth. So again, it's no touch registration and no touch uh, shared decision making. We do, when, when they're ready for their screen, we do pre-screening questions for pulmonary symptoms. Uh, they'll text or email insurance uh, confirmation and their ID, so they don't have to do that in person. And then uh, they actually receive the telephone number of the registration desk at the site at which they will be screened. So we, have, we screen at 16 different sites. So uh, that person, because we're, we're suburban, so we're not downtown New York, so um, people will typically uh, drive to their site. So when you get to their site, what would you normally do if you're going to um, get an x-ray or go to an office? You're gonna go sit in a waiting room. No, we don't. The waiting room is now the parking lot. So the subject leaves the home in their car and then uh, they go to the screening site and at the screening site, they check in by phone with the phone number that was given to them to the registration site uh, at the screening site. So they don't sit in the waiting room. Uh, the registrar uh, screens again for pulmonary symptoms and all those kinds of things. And then we ask that the subject wear a mask. If they don't have a mask, we'll supply one. And um, uh, we do this in a cycle. So when the previous subject or patient finishes their screen and, and walks out, then uh, this uh, new subject goes to registration and with their own pen or with a clean pen, signs a consent and gets a bracelet. So that's the only um, uh, really uh, physical interaction they would have with anyone. So then we do what we call a low touch screening process. The subject proceeds directly to the scanner, does not sit in the waiting room. We have two CT techs, one manages the patients one manages the scanner. So the person managing patient wears masks and gloves, and now we're requiring that you wear a face shield. Uh, there's a clean white sheet on the gantry. Uh, the scan is performed. Uh, patient or the subject uh, leaves the scanner and, um, and then, uh, you know, literally walks back out to the waiting room to their car. The sheet is removed and it's a place in a covered hamper, not an uncovered, in a covered hamper. And we use a product called Defense, D-I-F-F-E-N-S-E. -E. The gantry is disinfected with Defense. It's bactericidal at one minute. We have it dwell actually for three minutes where it, uh, it's known to be virucidal. And then we, you know, we rinse and repeat. And we call the next person um, back. So, you know, what's the rationale? Well, I feel that there's less exposure risk to the patient doing their lung screening than participating in the essential services such as going to a grocery store or a pharmacy. So we just can't use potential risk for exposure um, as an excuse you know, to not screen people. So um, our volumes typically are around about 440, 450 cases a month. Then March and April, things really did shut down. Uh, then in June, we had all this pent up demand. So we did about uh, 740 uh, screens in June. We did about 700 in July. Um, and you know, we're continuing on the 700 to 750 rate uh, in early August. Besides this uh, uh, um, makeup of the pent up demand, we're actually standing up an incidental nodule program in September, and that will add another um, 10,000 uh, CT scans a year to our volumes that we will be managing through our multidisciplinary clinic. So in conclusion, uh, it's well uh, demonstrated now by the Cleveland Clinic folks that a delay in detection and therefore treatment reduces survival. So it is imperative to continue screening even during difficult times. Lung screening can be performed safely in the COVID era with less exposure than the grocery store or the pharmacy. And uh, uh, we should really resist the temptation to stop everything uh, while we work you know, within the pandemic. And that's a really simple um, solution to screening in COVID. Bill, thank you. 
Um, and again, keep your questions coming and we'll be able to revisit them at the end of the program. But Debbie, I'll turn to you to continue on with the dialogue. And Debbie, you're on mute too. How about now? Okay, um, so it's a real pleasure to be um, with you today. And I wanted to share with you just a little about how the ACR came to produce our uh, resumption of lung cancer screening toolkit. First of all, we do have a committee in the ACR that's called Lung Cancer Screening 2.0. And we started this committee almost exactly two years ago now. And the charge of the committee was to address the barriers of lung cancer screening and increase the uptake of lung cancer screening across the country. And so we've been doing that for two years and working on a number of projects. One of the most valuable parts of our committee is that we have a wide variety of stakeholders on, on the committee. Not only do we have radiologists and pulmonologists and primary care folks, but we also have representatives from American Lung, American Cancer, certainly the Go To Foundation, and so forth. So we feel very fortunate to have a wide group of folks, um, including also navigators. So when March hit this past year, uh, we recognized that there was guidance from the CDC that we really needed to postpone non-urgent imaging. I, I like how Dr. Mayfield phrases it that, you know, well, we probably could do two things at once, but at that time, there were a lot of unknowns. And so we advised lung cancer screening programs around the country to follow the CDC guidelines and most radiology facilities around the country then really did cut way back and did really a only emergent type services. And so screening was put on hold. And of course, we are struck by the data and the reduction in fact that was quoted by Dr. Mayfield about the potential decrease in survival that we're gonna see without the valuable lung cancer screening that we know can save lives. So recognizing the necessity to get patients back into screening and recognizing that around the country there are spikes, there are ebbs, there are plateaus, that COVID is going to be with us for a while. And if facilities are at a place in, in a locale <laughs> that they think they can restart screening, then we wanted to provide a toolkit to help them do this. And so we formed a committee, a subcommittee within our 2.0 committee. And we had representatives on that committee then uh, again from across the various um, groups and uh, groups of stakeholders. And so I did ask uh, Dr. Eric Hart to lead the committee and he, he absolutely agreed to do it. And Eric was a perfect person to do it because he was already filled with ideas for how we could approach this. And so I'm going to have, I'm gonna turn everything over to Eric here in just a moment, because really most of the work that we accomplished was under his guidance with his subcommittee, the subcommittees acknowledged at the bottom of this webpage. Um, but, you know, certain things like recognizing that we needed to encourage programs to use telehealth uh, for the shared decision-making and providing programs with how can you charge for that? How can it be done? Um, and what documentation is required? All those things are just logistics that are important. And we wanted to make those things part of the toolkit. So recognizing that what we're really trying to do here is provide a safe environment for patients and make patients feel safe. Um, we produced this uh, toolkit, which, you know, if, you'll recognize we're trying to address programs, not only large programs, but smaller programs, programs in rural areas where they don't have 
perhaps all the resources that some of the larger programs have. So we tried to um, cast a wide um, net as far as embracing how different facilities are set up. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Eric Hart to you now, who is a thoracic radiologist at Northwestern in Chicago. He's the director of the lung cancer screening program there. And Eric, I'm, I really am just delighted to um, hand it off to you and you can share then all that you've done. <laughs> Thank you, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you, Dr. Dyer. So I have to say that um, really it's not what I've done, it's what we've done as a team. Uh, we've done as a team with the ACR Lung Cancer Screening 2.0 Committee and the subcommittee there, um, but also really hands off to, or, or, or hats off rather to my nurse coordinator, Denise Wojcik, who um, initiated this process really for us at Northwestern. Uh, Denise has always been very concerned about uh, both uh, growing the program, increasing the number of eligible people who actually seek out screening and also uh, retention. And in the COVID era, when we were being forced to call patients up and postpone them or cancel them, um, you know, she was early on thinking, well, how do we get people back? And uh, as a result of that, initially I was unsure when we were going to be able to get them back. But at, as, a, as a patient myself, who actually had uh, a medically necessary but um, quote unquote non-urgent procedure delayed during COVID, um, once that happened to me and I started understanding that we really needed to message people in some sort of an organized fashion to really reassure them and, and get them to come back to screening when it was appropriate. So I'd like to welcome Ashley LeBlanc to the conversation and she will um, uh, assist Dr. Hart with um, a conversation around each of the resources that are available and, and walk us all through um, what resources um, you have for your use. So, hi everybody. So um, I would just wanna say really quick that I'm so excited and about this and thank you guys so much for all the work that you've put into it. Um, so from what I understand and what I've looked at, um, the ACR's published four-tiered plan for returning to routine imaging care really places lung cancer screening into tier three elective care and screening. However, with um, these resources, the ACR recognizes the need and is helping screening programs consider if and when screening should be addressed as tier two time sensitive, which Dr. Mayfield um, talked to um, a little bit about the importance of kind of not putting that off too much, um, which of course might need to be resumed earlier during the reactivation of, of routine imaging care. Right. and so. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to bring to everybody's consciousness really is that um, yes, there are articles and consensus articles about potentially delaying care, but as Dr. Mayfield displayed on the graph, uh, there are potential consequences to that in terms of worsening overall patient outcomes. And so thinking about lung cancer screening as a time sensitive care element for patients really seemed to be logical to me and to the members of the committee when we when we tossed it out and, and talked about it. And, and I think that, you know, for many places, um, as long as you have appropriate resources, as long as you can um, operate within your institutional policies, as long as you can operate within local government mandates that may exist in your area, we can safely bring lung cancer screening into tier two as a time sensitive um, medical option for people and really get them to come back to screening hopefully sooner rather than later. So can you walk us through how this quick uh, reference guide lays out a method to potentially prioritize our screening patients as we begin to re-engage with them? Yes, so so we were thinking uh, after Denise had brought this to my consciousness really that patients needed to be prioritized in the lung cancer screening world just like in everywhere else and you know, patients, some patients are going to be a little bit um, less willing to come back. Some are going to be a little bit more willing to come back. But we need to establish larger groups of people in whom we want to message earlier in the process or maybe a little bit later in the process. And so uh, looking at some of the published information about delaying 
screening and delaying care and looking at uh, you know what we know from using the lung rads algorithms to categorize patients those who have previously been screened and had a lung rads three or four result um, mean it puts them into a category that we are identifying as potentially at higher risk for actually having a lung cancer. And so we wanted to make sure that those folks came back uh, quickest when it was appropriate for them. And by quickest, I mean those that had already had a screen and were actively due for their follow-up for their lung rads category three or four result, or those that were overdue for that result. We thought as a group that they should be in the highest tier of priority in terms of bringing people back into the screening and follow-up process. Um, and then just below that would be those who have previously been screened and had a negative screen with a lung rads uh, category one or two result, but were already overdue for their follow-up. So let's say, you know, you were screened in February or March of 2019, and you set up your follow-up appointment for April of 2019, but now we've called you up and delayed you. We want you to come back as soon as possible when things are safe, uh, both within your own mind and within our institution for you to come back. And so we thought that as a group that those would be the priority two patients. Priority three would be those who had had a previous lung rads one or two results. So they've been previously screened. We have them in the program and they're just coming up for their uh, one year anniversary for their annual screen. And then we placed in the lowest priority level those patients who would be new to the lung cancer screening program. And really we did that before there was um, a, a recommendation from the Medicare side that we could do uh, shared decision-making as a telehealth visit. And so um, once that occurred, I think really at this point, now that we know that and, and that that's actively being used, priority groups three and four could potentially be considered the same. I think that's a good point. I mean, I know at least with our screening program, we're in Western Mass and while Massachusetts saw a good spike really more towards April, um, a lot of that really affected the, the Eastern half of the state more than us out here. So when we shut down our program, we, we definitely um, actually continued screening our lung red three and four follow-ups even while the rest of our program was otherwise shut down because that's what made sense for us and, and our place. And we really wanted to avoid trying to delay that that care. So that said, do you think that all programs should adopt these priority categories or do you think that they might vary a little bit based on community conditions, program circumstances, volume levels, that sort of thing? Well, I don't think there's a one size fits all for uh, lung cancer screening programs for sure. But I think that um, those who are running programs should be able to you know, look at, at the priority listing and decide if in their area that it's appropriate for them and go with that. And, and we recognize that, um, you know, we are dealing with lots of different lung cancer screening programs with varying degrees of uh, underlying help from their systems um, so that resources are not uniform across lung cancer screening. And in small places or places that are, are only uh, now beginning screening or have small programs, for instance, they might not have the ability to prioritize as, um, as robustly as a larger program might be able to. And so I think everyone should take into account their local scenarios where you know, they, they look at the resources that they have and try to fit them into what um, the priority levels could be for them. And so if we go a little further down in the document, for instance, um, you know, if we have a small center that only has one CT scanner in their place and they do have inpatients and outpatients and it's a mixed population, as much as possible, if they're able to have the outpatients move to a single day, for instance, or a dedicated time frame at the end or beginning of a day when the machine is more easily, um, uh, done, has had more easily and more easily disinfected, excuse me, then those are some of the suggestions we would offer for them. But in terms of prioritizing their group, if they only have a small group of patients, then they should be actively trying, I think, to bring all of them back. Um, and if we get into a, a slightly larger program where maybe they've got multiple CT scanners or they've got multiple sites and they can refer all of the outpatients to one site and keep them 
separated from the inpatients, that might improve the uptake on the part of the outpatients, number one, because uh, it can be seen as a safer option for them. But number two, it also then allows them to pull in other resources as a program, potentially uh, using things like uh, um, you know, lung cancer risk calculators to try to prioritize within the priority groups if they have enough patients in order to bring back those at high at risk, highest risk first. Uh, I think for as we move down the document here, we see the, lung, the large lung cancer screening programs. Those programs can be described by size, but also by resources. And for programs that have a lot of resources who can definitely segregate out patients from inpatients, obviously we would recommend doing that. Um, we might be able to prioritize patients uh, in addition to just by lung rad score or by time block, uh, how late they are for their follow-up or for their screen, for instance, we might be able to use the lung cancer risk stratification um, using like the PLCOM 2012 model, for instance, to try to say, okay, within the lung rads three and four population, since we have 90 of them, we need to bring back, let's try to run them through stratify them and bring the you know bring them back in risk order based on that as well as just the fact that they were a three or four and uh, as dr mayfield showed in in their program where they're dedicating specific technologists for instance so that one person is with the patient and one person is with the scanner uh, those are all great ways when you have the resources to really amp up the fact to your patients that you're really trying to protect them as well as your own staff when they come in to see you. Absolutely. And I mean, I love that this is actually broken down to take into consideration the size of programs because oftentimes I feel like we get this information that, you know, well, that might work at this big academic facility, but that's not going to work for my little tiny community hospital. Um, so I think that's really wonderful that you guys took that into consideration. How do you feel um, your patients have been receptive to, to this process? Well, our program is not as large as what Dr. Mayfield was describing, but we've seen a similar kind of uptick where there is this demand that is there in the background that we had to postpone for a while. And so as we came uh, into June and July and now August, once we started bringing patients back in, um, the demand has actually exceeded the typical demand for us. And uh, we have really focused on bringing in patients who were already in our system. So our retention rate is actually uh, going up higher than typical as well, which I think is a great, uh, great side effect of reaching out to patients and trying to make sure that they feel reassured that they can come in safely and then bringing them back. We haven't yet uh, started doing shared decision making via telehealth. We are um, really kind of a hybrid program and we don't have a nurse practitioner who can take those calls right now. Most of our shared decision making occurs via our primary health, uh, primary care physicians and APPs. And so um, because of that, we're trying to get information to them that they can use the telehealth, but we don't have an alternate pathway yet to uh, improve uptake through that method right now. And I think, I know one of the things that we did when we were starting to reopen, I mean, our, our, our hospital, we're lucky that we're part of a hospital system that, that gave us really good guidance um, as far as what we did. But one of the things we did with diagnostic imaging is we really started um, opening it back up in a tiered fashion because we really shut down anything non-urgent, non-emergent. Um, so when we started opening back up, we actually opened lung screening up before mammography, before a lot of routine actually most routine scans. So we actually had almost two to three weeks where we were able to bring screeners in um, that really helped with a lot of that backlog because we weren't competing for all those CT slots. One of the other things that um, our, our leadership helped us uh, do here is try and create a, a COVID free zone, if you will. So anyone coming in for a screening would not cross paths for anyone um, that's PUI suspected, um, confirmed inpatient. So we, we kind of separated our screeners. And again, we were only able to do that because we weren't screening or I, I should say scanning because I'm not just talking about screeners uh, at full capacity. So we had one scanner that was kind of dedicated to inpatients, ED, and then another one for um, screening, which is 
really nice that we were able to do that. But um, I know that backlog has been kind of a, a hot topic for screening programs that have been shut down for an extended period of time. And I just know that's one of the things that that helped us here, which was nice. Well, I think that, you know, we, we're lucky in that we have dedicated scanners we can do outpatients on. Uh, so we're large enough to have that. And um, interestingly for me, my favorite scanner for the lung cancer screenings is one of our inpatient scanners, but I've redirected all of our patients away from it. Um, and, you know, we keep them where we don't cross paths with anyone who is known or highly suspected of having COVID. But, you know, with community transmission, you know, we're, we're doing the best we can. And all patients who come into our facilities are required to wear a mask. Uh, and actually, if they're wearing um, a cloth mask, they're required to put on a surgical mask when they enter the facility. So, you know, we're doing all of the, the necessary things to try to help ensure everyone is safe and, and segregating our patients in terms of outpatient versus inpatient was one of those things. Um, the, the backlog is interesting for us in that we have a lot of uh, local governmental mandates on how we can operate. And we also have a very actively involved administration that was uh, reprioritizing as we were starting to um, reopen for more routine services. Um, and I realize this is being recorded, but we kind of went under the radar a little bit early on to start bringing some of our patients in at the head of the list rather than uh, waiting another couple of weeks. And so we did get started before screening mammography, for instance. Uh, and it really, I think, helped us because the scanners weren't very busy. We were able to let patients, you know, set the time they wanted to come in when it was convenient for them. And uh, it helped with our early efforts to bring people back for sure. Sure. And it allows you to space them out more that way, right? Because we don't want people in the waiting room. We want to get them in and out. So that's right. Great. And we, we have uh, text uh, messaging to have people stay in their cars until their appointment time and stuff like that. But, you know, we're in the center of a big urban area. There's, there's only one parking garage. There are only a few, well, there are multiple doors in, but the system has closed off some of the entrances and exits so that we bring patients in through prescribed pathways in order to minimize risk and stuff. So I think we, we've done those things as well to try to help out. So I did uh, read an article this morning, ironically, um, in JAMA Internal Medicine that noted the need to make clinical services safe is matched by the equally critical need to make them feel safe. Safe practice makes no difference when the demand is gone. So how do you feel that screening programs can really reassure their patients and address any fears about um, coming back into a medical facility? Because I, I don't know about you guys, but I, I can't imagine that's not just us that are, are seeing that. No, we've had certainly some patients who do not want to come in, but even, even during uh, the worst part of the pandemic, for instance, um, we had patients who didn't want to be postponed at the same time. So there's a bell-shaped curve for people's risk tolerance. And I think one of the best ways that you can address people's fears is to just reach out to them either in letter format or by telephone uh, whatever it takes, answer their questions, basically, because, you know, part of the front face of medicine has not been very good about that in the past. And that's also pointed out in that article that you that you reference. We're not good at some of the soft touch things that other um, quote unquote businesses are. And, and uh, in the pandemic, we have to learn quickly how to do some of those things better. And uh, I've had the fortunate good luck to be a part of the NLST. And I also have a special population that I screen here and reaching out has been part of that um, working knowledge for a while now. It's still not probably the thing I'm best at, but um, I reach out on occasion to patients directly. Um, my nurse practitioner, Denise, reaches out to patients all the time. And so having that, that person that you know helps engender the trust that's necessary really to uh, listen to what sites are doing to try to make you feel safe and for you then to decide whether or not you think it's safe enough for you to come in. Definitely. Um, one of the other things that are, are part of the um, care are the letters. I see that there's four different letter templates um, that the program uses. I think there we go, she's pulling them up now. Um, 
and it looks like these have slightly different audiences and are timing that they're designed for. Do you want to talk a little bit about those? Because I think these are awesome. Sure. Uh, so the first one that's up here called the reassurance letter is, is really just that. It's a letter that uh, we wanted to put together to send to patients who were in the program or who had inquired about lung cancer screening, for instance, to let them know that um, we were going to be screening again or we are screening again um, to let them know that, you know, we've taken the precautions that are recommended. We may have gone above and beyond what's been recommended, but we want them to understand that, you know, it is safe for you to come in. Um, you are going to have to undergo some level of screening to come in. It may be a thermal temperature scan. You're going to have to put on a mask. Um, but those are the things that are necessary in order to keep everyone safe. And uh, I like at, at the bottom of this uh, letter a couple of different things. Um, number one, if you have questions or concerns, contact us. You know, we're here to help answer your questions. We want to make sure that you do feel safe in coming in because we want you to come back. You know, you're, you're in a program, uh, you're not here for a single event. And, and we know that, you know, you need to be feeling safe about coming back so that you will come back and that if you do come back, then we have the best chance of serving you well. Um, and then the last sentence, you know, we look forward to, to seeing you again. And, and we do. I mean, again, we're talking about patients who are actively involved in a program and, and we want to make them feel safe enough to come back again and again for their recommended screenings. I love it. And it's just, it's, I mean, to me, and I realize I'm biased because I'm in the medical field, but it just sounds so, it sounds like a letter you'd get from a friend, you know, like, I hope this finds you safe and healthy and I'm looking forward to seeing you again. It just, we really, we're seeing so much fear right now with the coronavirus pandemic everywhere, not just in our patient population. Um, and I just, you guys did such a spectacular job. And I know there's a couple other ones if you want to touch on those. Well, so I think, uh, you know, kudos out to, again, my coordinator, Denise, who <clears throat> I started working on letters with, and then we adapted them, um, provided them to the subcommittee and, and got, a, got input on, on what the letters should say for the um, toolkit. Uh, but, you know, her focus has always been on people, um, getting people who should be in screening into screening and keeping people who are in screening to continue on. And so I probably would have come out with something maybe a little sharper, maybe a little colder personally <laughs> myself. Uh, but Denise really, you know, emphasized to me that, you know, we do need to take a personal note here because these are people with real fears, not just of COVID-19, but also of, you know, if I get screened, will they tell me that I've got something that's suspicious this time around, for instance? And so um, understanding that, you know, it's, it's a measured approach to, hey, let's have a conversation about getting you to come back. We want you to feel safe to do so. We want you to, you know, want to come back for what's been recommended in the past. And I think the letters really um, do try to approach that. Uh, this template that's up now, it's, it was for the people who had already been here previously had had a lung rads three or four result uh, and really needed to return for the recommended follow-up and uh, we try to do things in concert with our primary care physicians uh, we do have a new lung nodule follow-up program that's going to launch here very soon as well and we will be working with them um, hand in hand to make sure that we can bring people back at the appropriate intervals uh, but we want uh, our, our referring physicians to know that we're not trying to take patients away from them. We're not trying to overwhelm their management. Uh, so we want the patient who we are sending this letter to, to call them and have a discussion with them and make sure that everyone's on the same page, that this is the right time for them to come back. Um, again, it goes into the things that they may see or be required to go through when they come into the facility. And uh, this would be at really any facility, you know, social distancing, like Dr. Mayfield discussed, um, maybe scanning, wearing a mask, those kinds of things. So it really is designed to keep everyone who has been involved in the process from the screening center to the referring physicians to the patient involved in the process going forward. 
And I think there's a couple other ones. There's a postponed a screening letter. Yep, that's what's up right now. And right. this could be for people who are lung rods one or two, just our annual people returning for their scan. Right, and so and it was also for the people who, yes, who had lung rads one or two who had been postponed or who, and we wanted to bring them back and really would work uh, with minor changes for people who were starting into the program just to let them know that, you know, we are taking these safety measures for you and um, we would, you know, want you to call us if you have questions or concerns so that we can make sure that everything is set up to your satisfaction before you get here. Um, but they are, you know, the, all three of the ones that you've shown so far are slightly different populations that we were trying to reach. And so they have uh, some slightly different verbiage and things. But the, ultimately, it's about, you know, maintaining the trust that hopefully we've already built with the patient uh, so that they feel safe in coming back to see us again. And then the fourth template is a referring provider letter. And I know that that's kind of been a hot topic lately. I know it's a, a question for anyone who's doing their uh, screening center of excellence uh, designation <laughs> survey right now. Um, but how do we keep our, our providers in, involved in referring and, and getting the patients coming back to us, particularly those programs who are not set up? I think mine sounds like it's set up like yours. We automatically generate all of our orders for our patients, but mo a lot of other programs leave it up to the primary care to send every year or re-refer set up those screenings? Yeah, I think, um, so this is probably tougher in some ways than uh, letters or phone calls to patients to try to directly bring them back in that we have um, facilities of varying sizes that are gonna have uh, differing numbers of referring physicians. And certainly most facilities are gonna know who their big referring population is and they can target something directly to that population. But in the larger view of things, the referring physicians who are doing primary care, um, you know, they're overwhelmed on a daily basis typically anyway, and they're adjusting to doing visits by telehealth and um, getting them more information sometimes is not information that's useful to them because it doesn't help them get through their day as efficiently as they would want to because it's just something else to read. And so I think this is a work in progress. I mean, I, this is a if you know you have referring docs who will read a letter or an email or something, then uh, this is a good template for, for starting that conversation again. Uh, some of them I think reaching out directly to is probably a great thing just to say, look, you know, your patients are, are safe to come in. We've got all of the recommended safety steps and precautions in place. We know it's a busy time for you, but um, we also know that we need to maintain momentum with screening because delays can result in poorer outcomes. And, uh, you know, that's really the message that we need to be on target with. Um, but it is hard for the referring community right now, just because of everything else that they have to go through. They, they're doing a lot of um, reassurance of patients just to get them in for things that are urgent sometimes. And so um, if they don't view lung cancer screening is having the same time sensitive nature as we do, that makes it even tougher for us. Sure. So we've, we've talked quite a bit about um, people coming for their scans, but there's also been a lot of changes with uh, telehealth right now during COVID-19. And there's some new options when it comes to shared decision um, making, which I know my providers are very excited about. They love televisits, they never wanna go back. Um, and I see that the ACR also made a one pager on this too. So what do we need to know about this? Uh, we need to know that it's a viable option basically. Uh, before the ACR had, had very few things that they were allowing, not the ACR, excuse me, CMS had very few things that they were allowing telehealth to uh, be used for. But in the COVID pandemic, they have really opened up the number of, of televisits that are possible. And uh, importantly to patients and to providers, um, what this allows for is fewer touches, uh, as Dr. Mayfield alluded to earlier, so that most of the visit um, necessities for a Medicare patient who's going to be coming in for the first time can be done remotely, where they're at home, where they're safe, where they feel comfortable. And then only when it's time for them to come in, do they actually come into the facility, have their screen in a safe fashion, and uh, then go back home. Um, 
importantly, when performing shared decision making as a telehealth visit, uh, it is for the people who, who do the visits uh, billable in the routine fashion using the G code has a special modifier, the modifier 95. Uh, the same people who can order lung cancer screening routinely in the Medicare world can do so uh, in the telehealth shared decision making world uh, because we know that for you know the Medicare first visit, they have to have had shared decision making beforehand. Uh, and importantly, Medicare is paying the same amount for the shared decision making visit performed via tele as if it were furnished in person. So I think in terms of making people comfortable that they can accomplish this with limited contact with the healthcare system for those who are interested in that, uh, this is really a game changer. And we will see if CMS keeps this up after the COVID pandemic subsides, whenever that may be. Uh, but as a first pass, uh, again, I really think this is a game changer. Uh, there are some resources at the bottom of this, including the Medicare telemedicine provider fact sheet, which is important to review. Um, you know, ideally Medicare would like you to do these visits as a video visit, uh, but it can be performed audio only. Um, and so really adopting this, I think, will go a long way, uh, potentially anyway, to reassuring our patients that we really are trying to take their safety and their best interests to heart. That's fantastic. So I think we have a 10-ish minutes left for questions. Is that right, Angela? That is correct. And Anita, if you want to chime in and begin sharing from some of the uh, questions that have come in via the Q&A tab. Um, thanks. Uh, thank you to all the presenters too. Such great tools and resources um, during such an unprecedented time with uh, COVID-19 and the need to resume screening safely. Um, a couple questions have come through. Some of them have been answered online in the chat in the Q&A box. So I'd uh, refer you to look at those answered questions that have that have been in writing. Um, I'll start with um, a question that came in. Uh, during Dr. Hart's talk. Um, so this would probably be for him or maybe even for Ashley. So this came in from um, Jonathan Corbin. Uh, they were wondering if you used any metrics to determine if the community um, has COVID-19 contained enough to resume screening. Um, so if so, what metrics do you recommend? Well, uh, I'm fortunate. Hold on a minute, I'm getting a little feedback here. Uh, I'm fortunate to live in Chicago where we have a, a robust public health department or certainly more robust than it was six months ago and a mayor who's very interested in uh, maintaining the safety of all of the citizens of Chicago and so really it's the local public health and governmental authorities who are determining safe levels of uh, community spread and of COVID-19 and, and they place more or fewer restrictions on operating as things go on. Uh, the governor in Illinois has also divided the state out into various territories where um, they can have more or fewer restrictions based on uh, local transmission rates in those territories, uh, Chicago and Cook County uh, being considered uh, closely together as uh, our catchment area, for instance. And so we are under those rules. Um, I don't know, I don't have a, have a direct number that I can share. And um, I think probably the best resource would be uh, the numbers coming from each individual state's uh, public health office for your local region. So uh, I, would, I would like to respond to that question as well. Sure. Um, so uh, it would be my position that uh, we've learned very clearly during this time that uh, what occurs in the intensive care unit and up on the floors in the inpatient setting has essentially nothing to do with the supply chain, uh, personnel, uh, or equipment or expertise required to uh, read, uh, to perform and read CT scanners at an outpatient setting 15 miles away. Um, so I would not say that there are any specific metrics or that there are any specific um, public health uh, issues, those are political issues. Those are not 
medical care, outpatient medical care issues. So um, we, we've at least, me as the chief surgical officer of the largest health system in Georgia, has taken the position saying that <clears throat> the limitations um, put on outpatient surgery will be when uh, anesthesia machines are required as ventilators, when um, uh, OR circulating nurses are needed, uh, you know, as emergency room nurses or ICU nurses, when uh, there are no uh, 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 inpatient beds for our surgery patients to go to, then we would start limiting those services. But those types of things are completely disconnected from a purely outpatient service. And so um, we need to be more nuanced in the practice of medicine on an individual basis than just the painting everything with a broad brush and saying, well, if we have COVID in this community, we can't do X. Well, in fact, we're the people who do X and we'll know when we're ready not to do X. Um, uh, so that would be my position. So there are no metrics. It's a question of resource, uh, uh, resources and allocation. I think those are excellent points, um, Dr. Mayfield. So thank you for sharing that. Kind of in the same vein of questions though, um, uh, there was another one that came in that says, at what rate of community spread is the risk of acquiring um, a COVID-19 infection greater than potential benefit of lung cancer screening? So I would say that the two premises in that question are completely disconnected. So um, if uh, there's a rate of COVID transmission uh, in the community, I would say that that does not translate to you leaving your couch, going into the garage, getting in your car, and driving to a place where you're going to then put on a mask and spend three minutes getting a scan and coming out. Uh, we we I, I just showed by our model that there's much less risk of exposure to COVID in that than there is going to the grocery store or going to a pharmacy or going to a birthday party, a kid's birthday party or something like that. I, I think those two are disconnected. If there is a risk of, connect, of, of contracting COVID by driving through the community in your car, then, then there's, a, there's a calculated risk. But I would say that um, those two uh, don't measure up to each other. Thank you for that. Um, a couple more, and Dr. Mayfield, this might either go to you or even Dr. Dyer. Um, it came in during your talk, uh, Dr. Mayfield. So a question came in from Jody Steinart. How much time do you leave between patients when scheduling? I'm not a scheduler. Uh, I only know that uh, we uh, have specific uh, dwell times for the, the cleaning uh, that we do. So you know, we do require a minimum of a three minute dwell time, but I can't tell you what the, um, the scheduling rate is. And then another question came in. Um, in our program, a lot of follow-up is coordinated by the primary care physician's office or whoever was the ordering physician. Um, if we notice that a patient, um, if, if we notice that patients haven't had their follow-up scan, they'll send letters to them in certain intervals. What's your recommendation to further motivate primary care physicians uh, in one's area to continue this? So as we showed at the Georgia Lung Cancer Roundtable, um, the only way to make a, a, a program grow is direct engagement with your primary care physicians. So uh, we reach out to those uh, primary care folks, um, you know, directly. So not not by letter. They're they're already overwhelmed with uh, email messages and with paper and letters and things like that. So we reach out personally. Our navigators reach out personally. Frankly, we make lung cancer screening. Uh, we take that off their plate. We don't. They don't have to do any sort of follow up. We do all the scheduling, all the reading, all the reporting, and then we report back to them uh, if something needs to be done. Um, I, I want to take that effort um, off of the primary care doctor. So again, we just engage directly with them, encourage them to, to refer their patient. Yeah, and I'd like to echo that. I mean, we definitely try to engage directly with the primary care physician, um, the, the entire primary care community in order to uh, ease their burden as much as possible. Uh, we will, um, because of the way our EMR is set up, there are certain things we can do for them and certain things we can't, but certainly, for instance, if a 
the patient has a lung RADS 3 and we've recommended the standard six month follow up, we can place that order in the system for them, uh, send them a message and say, you know, we've, we've placed the order for you to uh, just sign off on and we'll schedule the patient, et cetera. And, you know, we try to, we try to make it easy so that necessary follow up occurs. And I think that's the best way, um, as Dr. Mayfield was saying, if you make it easy for people there, um, then your compliance rate will go up. And I'd just like to echo what they both said. I think our program is set up similar to Dr. Mayfield's in that um, when we set up our program, when we were in the planning stages, we started doing outreach to primary care then to get their input on how they would see this set up. And some of the feedback that we got is what everyone has already said, PCPs are way overburdened, way. And you know how can we make this easier for them? So we do the shared decision-making visit. When, when a patient gets referred to our program, we do all the follow-up, their scheduling scans, and those are reordered by the provider who did their shared decision-making visit when they were enrolled. And all of this is explained to the patient during that, that shared decision-making visit. We really try to make the, the most of that 15 minutes, um, but, but really by setting their expectations and by the primary care expectations. And I think it took a little bit to gain some of the trust and them see that yes we were not going to let their patients fall through the cracks but when someone doesn't show up um, or like right now we're getting a lot of people who want to put off put off um, you know we really have someone call the patient we don't just immediately put a letter in the mail if they no call no show for example we have them call the patient and talk to the patient what's going on how can we support you um, you know what can we do for you how can we make, get you in here you know what are their fears and address those um, and I think that that's really helped. In the case where we can't get a hold of the patient, then we pull the primary care in. And what we have found is they, you know, and we tell them we've done X, Y, and Z, this is what they were due for. Um, and we found that they appreciate that so much that they're kind of our backup for getting on the patient's case to get them in the door to just be frankly kind of blunt about it. Um, but it works and it's effective most of the time. So I'm going to go over one or two more questions. Um, one came in asking about shared decision making. So can a registered nurse perform the shared decision making or does it need to be a physician, an MD, a nurse practitioner, um, a physician's assistant? Would it count if documented and not billed? So I think CMS is pretty clear about who can provide a shared decision making visit. It does have to be um, a physician assistant, nurse practitioner, or a physician. Um, it really can't be done, um, again, per CMS by a registered nurse. And it not only has to be documented, but it ha it's very specific in how it needs to be documented. And um, all of that information is right on, on CMS's um, website. I want to say uh, the AHRQ website has a really great infographic that kind of spells it out, you know, n n what needs to be documented and how to document that. Super helpful. Um, one question I want to uh, just throw out there that was already answered, and I think Dr. Mayfield might have answered this online, had to do with um, uh, hospital and patient outpatient radiology departments um, that are competing for scanner time. Uh, so those patients who, who are due for annuals, what is the recommended wait time if they can't fit them in during the annual month due? Yeah, I mean, um, I think it's pretty clearly demonstrated there. It, it, it's hard to defend uh, waiting. Uh, th there's a the, the calculations in that PLOS article were somewhere between 1.4 and 2.5% increase mortality per week delay. Uh, I, I don't, I, it's hard to defend uh, um, delay with, when you have resources available. That makes good sense. So I think that's the close of our questions. I'm gonna pass this back to Angela. Okay, give me just a moment to bring up my final slide. So 
As always, heartfelt thanks to all of you who joined us today for our webinar. And of course, our sincerest gratitude to Drs. Mayfield, Dyer, Hart, and to Ashley LeBlanc for being so very generous with their time and with their expertise. We did record today's webinar, just as with the previous ones, and we will share the recording link uh, with everyone very soon. Now, GoTo does have many, many resources that we hope will make all of your hard work a little easier. As I've said before, we aim to be the go-to for the O2 that gives you more breathing room in your own work. I'm sure that most of you by now are quite familiar with the, the vast range of patient education resources that we have available for you all on our website from the patient education video that explains the purpose, process, risks and benefits of lung cancer screening to encourage and prepare eligible patients for an informed dialogue and shared decision-making discussion with their provider. Um, and that video, of course, is also available with Spanish or simple Chinese subtitles. We have a wide range of other patient education materials from a comprehensive patient handbook to numerous brochures, one-pagers, and fact sheets on topics that span the lung cancer care continuum. And those are all available to you on our website under the four professionals section. And those can be downloaded as PDFs or ordered in hard copy for free um, in limited quantities. And you feel free to reach out to us at screening at gotofoundation.org. If you have any trouble finding any of these resources, we would be very glad to point you directly to them on our website. We have our Lung Cancer Living Room Patient Education and Support Series that is being hosted monthly, um, and sometimes bi-monthly, uh, live via video stream each month via our GoTo Facebook page and our YouTube channel. The next Living Room comes up one week from today, so Tuesday, August 18th, from 5.30 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. Pacific time. So for those of us on the East Coast, it's a little bit later night from 8.30 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. This month's speaker is Dr. Benjamin Levy with Johns Hopkins Sibley Memorial Hospital. The topic is new biomarkers, new therapies, and the importance of knowing your cancer. Recordings of all of our living room sessions can be viewed on GoToFoundation's Facebook page or our YouTube channel. And those are all linked from our website. If you look on the resource and support tab, you'll be able to find those links. Also coming up very soon, um, October 29th through 30th, so it's just around the corner, is GoTo uh, Foundation's Centers of Excellence in Screening and Care Continuum Virtual Summit. Through this virtual summit, we will be able to showcase how all of you, our Centers of Excellence partners, are leading the way in areas of early detection and multidisciplinary treatment of lung cancer. And through the summit, we'll also provide opportunities for collaboration and networking. We will be sending out registration information very soon, so keep your eyes peeled for that. Also, I will be sending out a brief evaluation survey of today's webinar via email. T please uh, take a couple of minutes, it's a very brief survey, take a couple of minutes to complete it and share your feedback to guide our future efforts. And as always, reach out to us at screening at gotofoundation.org with any questions, concerns, suggestions, et cetera, that you have. Before we go, we wanna extend our sincere thanks to our sponsors, AstraZeneca, Bristol Myers Squibb, Bristol Myers Squibb Foundation, Genentech, Lilly Oncology, Pfizer, and Takeda. And with that, we will bring today's webinar to a close. Stay well, everyone, and thank you again for joining us. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.